Hi, everybody, and welcome to a segment of SABCS Snippets. My name is Dr. Kate Lathrop. I'm a medical oncologist with UT Health San Antonio Mays Cancer Center, and I'm the program director for the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium. And my name is Sarah Delaney. I'm a breast medical oncologist at Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and really looking forward to our discussion today. Yeah, so just to catch everybody up, today we had a press release that mentioned that the Keynote 522 regimen that looks at early stage but high risk triple negative breast cancer treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy in combination with immunotherapy, which on this trial was pembrolizumab, then followed by surgery and followed by pembrolizumab for an additional nine cycles to complete a year of therapy regardless of, of PCR. Now we've had results about the event-free survival and we also had PCR results. So based on the PCR results and the event-free survival, this regimen has been approved to be used in the United States and is widely used now for early stage triple negative breast cancer. So what do you think about what we know from the press release today? Well, I think it's really exciting to see that this the press release suggests that there is a clinically meaningful improvement in overall survival from adding pembrolizumab to chemotherapy in the preoperative, followed by uh, adjuvant exposure uh, for our stage two, three triple negative breast cancer patients. And so I think this is really important. You know, as you alluded to, we know from Keynote 522 that adding pembro to chemo improved PCR rates, and now we're hitting a PCR rate of a little over 60%. We've also seen that it's preventing recurrences. We've seen that event-free survival is significantly improved. Now seeing a, about a 40% reduction in event rates in 522. And what was really important is that most of the events were distant events. And so logically one would think that if you're really preventing distant recurrence that that would translate into a survival difference. But it's also really always important to make sure that we are seeing that survival difference outcome because, you know, I think while improving PCR is important, what we really care about is making sure that the cancer doesn't come back so that we can, you know, prevent deaths from breast cancer. And so this is a big deal um, to, to see this press release. So really nice to see. You know, I think it also points out to the fact, though, that seeing reduction in distant events usually will translate into a survival difference. And, and I think that's what, what these data are really just confirming for us. Yeah, sure, absolutely. And I do think that brings up an important point. Our goal is not to necessarily achieve a, a, a PCR, but our overall goal is to prolong survival and decrease deaths from breast cancer. Um, how do you look at, you know, the Keynote 522 regimen is, is quite intensive. You know, it's it's for chemotherapy medicines given with a whole year of immunotherapy. And, you know, that's not without toxicity. Um, and some of these patients who are treated, you know, have potentially very early stage disease all the way down to T11C disease. So how how do you in your, your practice or how do you think about managing the toxicities of this regimen versus the benefits that we're seeing in the clinic, maybe particularly for your patients that have earlier stage disease. Well, I think you bring up a, an excellent point. You know, we're used to chemotherapy toxicity and we've been managing that for quite a while, but immunotherapy toxicity is a challenge because in, in some cases we leave patients with permanent lifelong toxicity. So, you know, we commonly see, for example, hypothyroidism develop in you know, about 20% of our patients, they're left on, um, you know, supplemental medications for the rest of their life. We see almost 5% of patients develop adrenal insufficiency uh, from use of pembrolizumab. They're on steroid replacement for the rest of their life. We don't really know what the implications of having these lifelong toxicities could be for young women, for example, who wanna go on and have children. Could it have an impact on future fertility? And, and we don't understand that very well. And so, uh, you know, it's not a little thing to uh, think about some of these side effects. And so I think, you know, we always have to weigh risks and benefits of each and every therapy. And here again, there is clearly benefit. Um, again, we've seen now PCR benefit, EFS benefit, and now survival benefit. So I think clearly important treatment but I think it does allude to the fact who needs this treatment? Um, are there patients who, for example, would have done just as well if they had just gotten maybe chemotherapy and not immunotherapy? Are there some patients who maybe don't need it? Um, are there patients who may need less 
chemotherapy, as you pointed out, it's four different chemo drugs and a year of immunotherapy. Do we really need to give that whole entire package to every single patient who can get away with less treatment? Can we eventually substitute part of this chemotherapy with other agents? Now antibody drug conjugates are moving into this space. Are there ways to maybe pare down and, and substitute treatment and maybe even improve efficacy with, with novel therapy? So, you know, I think we have a lot to learn, uh, but clearly uh, this does have benefit in it you know, in, in my mind is the standard of care for the vast majority of patients who have stage two and three triple negative breast cancer, they, they probably should be getting chemotherapy and immunotherapy until we can learn, um, you know, maybe better biomarker predictors of, of benefit. Sure. Yeah, one one uh, graph that always sticks out to me is the event-free survival based on PCR rate. And you can see in this trial that regardless of whether patients received immunotherapy or not, that piece, those who re, who gained a PCR from their neoadjuvant therapy had a lower event free, uh, a lower event free survival. Um, so if you have patients, I'm, I'm curious what, what trials you're really looking forward to kind of hearing the, re, the results from. If you have patients that do receive a PCR from their neoadjuvant therapy, you know, I think a lot of us are asking, do they do they really need additional therapy afterwards, whether it's pembrolizumab, whether it's capecitabine or, you know, something else, right, if they can't. So what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you raise a really important question, which is in Keynote 522, everyone got the full year of Pembro. It didn't matter what response you had at the time of surgery. You know, when the trial was designed, we didn't really understand at that time that adapting treatment based on response impacted outcomes and so everyone just got the same stuff but as you noted in keynote 522 we saw that the event-free survival for pcr patients was excellent that was true you know overall for the chemo patients and for the pembro patients but it is interesting that the patients who got pembro did seem to have a better efs even in the pcr population but we don't really know what's driving that is it the portion of the preoperative treatment where they got immunotherapy or is some of that benefit in terms of event-free survival being driven by the component of the immunotherapy after surgery yeah. and you know i think there's some allusion to the fact that maybe it's mostly driven by the stuff before chemo because we've seen data for example from jeff arnuevo which did not give the adjuvant component of the checkpoint inhibitor treatment and still had very similar efs to keynote 522 caveat being that was a small randomized phase two study, but still intriguing. We're also seeing in the pure adjuvant trials, like in Passion 30, there was no benefit to adjuvant atezolizumab when added to chemo. Again, different situation. It was sure. people who went to upfront surgery, but it does make me think maybe that component after surgery may not be so critical. So there is a study currently enrolling called Optimized PCR which is trying to address your exact question, which if someone gets pre-op chemo checkpoint, achieves PCR, you randomize them to that nine cycles of adjuvant Pembro, the 27 weeks, or to observation, and it's trying to show that there's non-inferiority. Um, so 3% margin is allowed to suggest that observation will do just as well as adjuvant Pembro. Um, so, you know, right now we need to enroll that trial, so it'll take us a number of years to get an answer, sure. but I think hopefully we'll address that question. Yeah, and you know, pembrolizumab, as you mentioned, is not the only thing driving toxicity, so does chemotherapy. So there's also trials looking at different chemotherapy backbones in the new adjuvant setting with pembrolizumab. There's SWOG, a scarlet trial that's accruing right now, looking at eliminating the anthracycline portion, but giving a longer duration of a taxane and carbo. So, um, my final my final question for you to get your thoughts on, uh, you know, we've been trying to figure out biomarkers that can help us pr predict which women with triple negative breast cancer in the early stage are really going to benefit from immunotherapy. Um, things like TILS has not really uh, panned out, neither has pdl one expression. Is there anything that you're looking forward to in the future that might, you know, help us sort women into different categories here for benefit? Yeah, I think this is a really key issue because we don't have a biomarker right now. As you pointed out, PDL1 and Keynote 522 did not predict who benefited from checkpoint. In fact, both PDL1 positive and negative patients benefited, which is obviously very different 
than the metastatic setting, where in, in metastatic triple negative disease, only the pd one positive patients to date have benefited from chemo checkpoint combo. So it's not pd one um, You know, we haven't seen the TIL data from Keynote 522 yet. We do know that TIL are prognostic. We also have data to suggest that it can predict benefit to chemo alone and to chemo checkpoint. So I'm not sure if it by itself will be a differentiator for us to figure out who really needs mm -hmm. chemo checkpoint. But there are lots of other interesting biomarkers that are also being looked at. Um, we saw some of this data from the Neopax trial, which um, you, know, you alluded to the data that has suggested that maybe we could get away with non-anthracycline based therapy in this setting. Um, this was work done by Priyanka Sharma and colleagues looking at, at taxi and carboplatin for six cycles and showing PCR rates very much in line with 522. And in that study, they had looked at a triple negative DX signature, an assay by Reveal that did seem to be able to predict when they compared it to Neostop, uh, patients who did seem to benefit from checkpoint rather than um, just chemo alone. Um, there's also this IgG signature, which seems to be predictive. So I think it's going to be much more complex. I don't think it's probably just one biomarker, but probably, you know, different signatures that are going to help us get there. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to figure that out sometime. Well, great. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And, um, you know, it's really exciting results that we're, we're seeing from Keynote 522 with overall survival for these patients. Very meaningful. Yeah, I totally agree. Very clinically meaningful and really nice to see. Thank you. Thank you so much.